This week, we explore the topic of why a Masonic Lodge is also referred to as a temple, and why it's not called a temple anymore, or is it? In this philosophical look at the temple versus lodge debate, we'll take apart what both terms mean, and how they're interchangeable, and maybe not interchangeable, within the greater umbrella of Freemasonry. Then, illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison stops by to talk to us about a fantastic journey stemming from the Grand Lodge of the state of Missouri, the one Grand Lodge that gave us more Freemasonry than any other Grand Lodge. That's right. In a look at last month's fraternal review, we read the first article from the title page of the issue on the Leo Taxel hoax. Who was Leo Taxel really? Why did he do what he did? And where can you get this particular issue? Finally, we'll wrap it up with a contemplative exercise. Are you out there solving problems and moving toward your goals using a massive force of your own intellect? Find out this and a whole lot more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back to the show. This is episode number 550. I want to thank the contributors, fellows, producers, and legacy partners of the WCY podcast for assisting us in the production of this show for the past 10 years, spreading Masonic light and information to all those interested in Freemasonry and its kindred sciences all over the planet. If you're curious on how you can help the WCY podcast accomplish its mission, head on over to wcypodcast.com. Click on support the show and check out your options. In addition, we've also got a limited edition shop as well as our bookstore, which contains links through Amazon to all of the books by people who have been on the show, their recommended reading, as well as my own recommended reading lists. All of them go through Amazon Affiliate. It doesn't cost you any additional money. It just gives the author a sale and the WCY podcast gets a few pennies. As far as presentations go, we are clear on the books until July, where I will be at the South Pasadena Masonic Lodges Masonic Con, the largest Masonic Con event happening on the West Coast. It also probably anywhere. It is in size rivaled even Ezekiel Bates' Masonic Con event. So I hope to see you guys all there. If you're curious on the tickets and how to get there, you're going to want to go to MasonicCon.com and you'll see all of the ticket prices and everything else that you can get for that event. Now let's get right into this week's education. We've got a few pieces that I think are really fun and are super relevant to Freemasonry. The first one comes from Majesty Montanez, written October 7th, 2018 for the philosophicalsociety.org, and it's called The Real Reason a Masonic Temple is Called a Lodge. Now, before we begin, I have often thought about this and have actually looked through multiple editions pretty much every single year of the Grand Lodge of the State of Illinois proceedings and many other Grand Lodges to find a time when we called a Masonic temple a lodge. Like, maybe there was a switch. Did we call them temples before? Hey, you know, you're talking to your significant other and you say, I'm going to temple tonight. Got Masonic temple tonight. Or I've got a Masonic temple meeting tonight. Or has it always been I'm going to lodge tonight. Where do we see perhaps the changeover from when we were referred to as a temple to being called a lodge? My initial thought was maybe this had something to do with the exposés from the time of William Morgan, or what was the deal there? And I couldn't find any evidence to suggest, at least since the after Morgan affair, of any time ever we've ever really referred to it as a temple. So here we are calling it a Masonic Lodge, calling it Lodge. But then we've got the Temple Board. We've got the Temple Association. It's very curious that we differentiate in these ways. I'm not sure what this paper is going to talk about yet, but let's check it out together. The real reason a Masonic Temple is called a Lodge. Why is a Masonic Temple called a Lodge? This is a very good question, and the correct answer to this question is full of valuable wisdom that is of great and essential importance to Freemasons in particular, and to philosophers in general. So, let us begin to unravel this mystery so that we can discover some of the useful life lessons 
that it has in store for us as philosophers or as lovers of wisdom. All students of Freemasonry know that Freemasonry is a system of a symbolic nature and that most of the foundational customs and symbols Freemasons are derived from the work of the stonemasons of ancient Egypt and other ancient countries. The universal Masonic custom of referring to our temples or meeting places as lodges is an example of one of those foundational customs and symbols of Freemasonry that come from ancient stonemasonry. Unfortunately, too many students of Freemasonry fail to realize that the soul or spirit of Freemasonry is essentially religious, philosophical, and spiritual. This causes these students to lack knowledge of the true and intended meaning of most of our Masonic symbols and to unknowingly give a false interpretation to not only our symbols but to Freemasonry as a whole. This is most often a result of the student limiting his studies to a trash heap of purposefully misleading books and articles on the history and subject of Freemasonry that have been published by unqualified, overly pretentious, and overtly biased self-proclaimed authorities on the subject. However, this lack of a true understanding of Freemasonry is primarily due to the student making the costly mistake of overlooking the significance of the simple fact that the work of ancient stonemasonry, which Freemasonry uses as an analogy or symbol of its own work and teachings, was centered around religion and philosophy, which is to say, the worship and study of Mother Nature, ourselves, and the Divine. As the old saying goes, the true nature of a tree can be known by the kind of fruit it produces. And the ancient stonemasons, not to be confused with brick masons, who were of many different cultures, nationalities, and religions, were the builders and creators of all the most important buildings of the ancient world, which were the temples and monuments dedicated to the gods and goddesses of ancient religion. By overlooking this aspect of the nature of the work of ancient stonemasonry, the non-Masonic student of Freemasonry usually misses the point that Freemasonry is likewise centered around God, the supreme architect of the universe. The religious, philosophical, and spiritual nature of Freemasonry is the reason as to why the meeting place of any group of Freemasons is called a temple, which is defined in everyday language as being a building devoted to the worship or regarded as the house or dwelling place of a god or gods. On the other hand, a Masonic temple is, as was already mentioned, is also called a lodge. And this is because ancient stonemasons, who were literally travelers or traveling men and traveling women, due to the nature of their work, which often required them to leave behind their families and homes for long periods of time, as they traveled from place to place and worked on various building projects all throughout the country, would always build several temporary houses called lodges near their worksite, which they used as both shelters and workshops. Although this obviously gives us the superficial reason for which we symbolically call our temples lodges, it would be very unwise of us to automatically conclude that this is the reason for the ancient universal custom in its entirety since we know that Freemasonry is essentially philosophical and spiritual, and uses its symbols as its main method of teaching and expressing important life lessons that are based on timeless philosophical principles and truths. It is therefore very highly likely that the word Lodge is a Masonic symbol that indirectly expresses a very deep and fundamental lesson for us about the true nature of our existence. Since the word Lodge is synonymous with the word Temple in the symbolic language of Freemasonry, we must logically conclude that they both symbolically refer to the human body as the quote-unquote house that God lives in. As is said in Corinthians 3.16 of the Holy Bible, which is another one of the many symbols of Masonic philosophy and spirituality, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? By applying the Masonic and Hermetic principle of correspondence, as within, so without, which is a universal law of nature to the human body. We discover that the human body can be symbolically and very accurately described as being a miniature replica of the universe, or existence as an infinite whole. This lets us know that the Masonic Temple, or the Masonic Lodge, is a symbol of both the universe and the human body. And this is very powerful, hinted at us in the symbolic description of the Lodge in the ritual of Freemasonry's first degree. Now that we know that the Masonic Lodge is symbolic of both the universe 
and the human body, and that Freemasonry thereby likens or compares the universe and the human body to a lodge of ancient stone masons, all that remains is for us to figure out why this is so. Once again, a lodge, by common definition, is a temporary house or home, as opposed to a permanent house or home, which would make a lodge a very fitting symbol of the universe, since the universe is not only quote-unquote the house and home of humanity, but a temporary house and home for us, as we will not be living in this world forever. We will all one day die, but until then we must continually come together and unite as Freemasons to do the work of Freemasonry, which is to evolve and perfect humanity, within the lodge or workshop, meaning within the universe or world of everyday life. This is perhaps the most basic of all of the valuable life lessons that we are indirectly taught by the Masonic Lodge being a symbol of the universe or the macrocosm, the big universe. When we look at the Masonic Lodge as being a symbol of the human body or the microcosm, the little universe, we learn an equally valuable life lesson. In the same way that the universe is a temporary house and home for humanity, so is the human body for the Spirit of God. And just as we must continuously come together and unite as Freemasons to do the work of Freemasonry within the workshop or lodge of the universe collectively, so must we also do the work of Freemasonry on an equally constant basis, individually, within the secret, inner lodge or workshop of ourselves as individuals, thereby achieving balance and harmony between the two opposite poles of selflessness and selfishness within us. As we can now see, the use of the word lodge as a symbol of Freemasonry contains some very useful and valuable life lessons for us, indeed. So let us take heed and let us continue to work both collectively and individually, but most important of all, unceasingly, toward the evolution and perfection of humanity. Well, there you go. This piece is obviously written by a co-Mason. It doesn't take away from anything that is being said in the piece. But it is interesting nonetheless to see the philosophical breakdown of this idea of the temple and the lodge and the body as a temple. I will have a link back to the original article, again published back in October of 2018. I hope you guys check it out and uh, continue to follow their blog for some excellent pieces. Next up, let's get into this week's Masonic Minute with illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison. Once the young United States became established as a country, and the march of time moved us past the first third of the 19th century, wanderlust captured the hearts of adventurous pioneers who began moving westward. In a time before instant communication and fast travel, the Santa Fe, California, and Oregon trails became the superhighways of the day. In St. Joseph, Missouri, hundreds of covered wagons lined up waiting to take the Francis Street Ferry across the Missouri River and into Kansas Territory to begin the long and treacherous journey west. Masonic brothers Joseph Hull, William Daughtery, and P.G. Stewart were three of those pioneers who finally settled in Oregon City. Once established in their new homes, the three placed an ad in the newspaper asking for local brothers interested in forming a chartered lodge to meet and begin the process. Seven brothers met on February 21, 1846 and drafted a letter requesting the Grand Lodge of Missouri grant a charter for what would be called Multnomah Lodge. They gave the letter to Brother Joel Palmer, who carried it back to Platte City Lodge 56 during the summer of 1846. He gave it to Brother James Spratt, who delivered it to the Grand Lodge, which granted the charter for Multnomah Lodge 84 in October and sent it back to Platte City. It took over a year to find an appropriate brother, Pierre Barlow Cornwall, who began his journey back west in April of 1847. Along the way, 
Cornwall met a couple of Masons who were also biological brothers, Joseph and Orrin Kellogg. The Kelloggs were also traveling to Oregon. The entire party barely survived when their wagon train was captured by Indians, but they somehow made it out alive and went to Fort Hall, Idaho, where the California and Oregon trails diverged. The California Gold Rush was just getting started, but it was the talk of the town at Fort Hall. Hearing about the gold, Brother Cornwall decided to seek his fortune. He gave the Multnomah Charter to the Kelloggs and literally headed for the hills. The Kelloggs completed the journey to Oregon, delivering the charter on September 11, 1848, two years and seven months after the brothers in Oregon had made the original request. Joseph Hull was so excited to receive the charter that he called a meeting that very day. The brothers set up lodge and fashioned podiums with a barrel of flour in the east, a barrel of whiskey in the west, and a barrel of salt pork in the south, with the contents representing corn, wine, and oil. Then, in a marathon meeting that lasted 16 hours, the members consecrated the lodge, elected officers, and held three entered apprentice, three fellow craft, and two master mason's degrees. Hull became the first master with the Kellogg's and Joel Palmer also filling offices. Unfortunately, gold fever swept up the brothers at Multnomah Lodge 84 and the majority left for California, which left the lodge in disarray. One of those Oregon brothers, Lot Whitcomb, started a steamboat company there and hired brother John Ainsworth to pilot his boat. Ainsworth became disenchanted with the gold rush and having heard about Multnomah from Whitcomb, traveled to Oregon where he not only brought the lodge back to life, but started the Oregon Scottish Rite. As a result of Ainsworth's efforts, Multnomah Lodge became the first chartered under the Grand Lodge of Oregon and remains in existence. Today, the ability to communicate instantaneously has become second nature to us. Any one of us could take the same months-long journey Joel Palmer or the Kellogg's took in less than a day. We take it for granted so much that it's hard to imagine the time, not to mention the danger of communicating and traveling back then. Under those conditions, however, Freemasonry blossomed and thrived, extending the length and breadth of the United States. The Grand Lodge of Missouri was at the center of this expansion. All in all, it granted 37 charters to lodges in 10 new jurisdictions, far more than any other Grand Lodge, earning it the title, as coined by iconic Masonic brother H.L. Haywood, the magna mater of American Freemasonry. For the Whence Came You podcast, this is Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. All right, how about that? The magna mater of Freemasonry, the Grand Lodge of Missouri chartering way more lodges than anybody else. What a wild and cool tale that Steve has outlined for us here. If you watch the video, he has a little bit of the cover of his book, Freemasonry Crosses the Mississippi, which is a fantastic book if you can find it. I think used copies I have seen on Amazon have been selling for uh, quite a number of dollars. So if you're interested in that, maybe put it on a watch list or check out and see if you can grab it on Kindle. But I do have links to it. They will be a link in the show notes as well as on our bookstore page, which uh, again is through Amazon. And of course, like I just said, there is a video that accompanies the audio. If you wanted to watch that video, you can head on over to Brother Steve's YouTube channel, The One Minute Mason, or you can find it as well on the WCY channel, Whence Came You on YouTube. Again, uh, 
We'll put a link in the show notes so you can get directly there. Or you can just go to WCYpodcast.com and you can click on any of the social platforms that we're on. We're on everything. We were even on Google Plus before it was uh, taken down. So anyway, once again, big thanks to illustrious Brother Harrison for all of his work that he continues to work on for Freemasonry and who keeps us interested in the philosophy and history and the craft. If you see Steve out there in the quarries, make sure you give him a hearty handshake and a high five and thank him so much for all that he does. All right. Now, I want to go ahead and read a piece that actually was published last month in the Southern California Research Lodge's Fraternal Review. It's from the May 2022 issue, The Taxel Hoax. And what I love about this particular issue is that it really attacks this whole Leo Taxel, Luciferian thing that non- or anti-Masons continually come back to, even though we have all of the information that proves it to be false. I would love to read the entire issue for you, but I'm not going to do that. I want you to go and check out the issue, and uh, you can get it at the Fraternal Review's website. It's called theresearchlodge.com. While you're there picking up this particular one issue, which is five whole dollars, you can consider checking out their 2021 annual, so all the 2021 issues in one book, which has uh, several awesome issues, including The Death of Ritual, The Masonic Legacy Society, Kabbalah and Freemasonry, The Middle Chamber, Stoicism and Freemasonry, The American Revolution, The Matrix and Freemasonry, The Top Ten Masonic Books of the New Millennium, Brotherly Love, Relief, and Truth, all the issues as originally published, and uh, they charge a whole 46 bucks plus shipping and handling for it. So if you really think about it, you're getting all the books for a $4 discount, essentially. And they're just now starting to ship those out. So anyway, let's read the cover story, Leo Taxel by Daniel Molina, again from the Fraternal Review. Born in France in 1853, Mary Joseph Gabriel Antoine Jogan Pages was a writer, journalist, and ruffian who would both amaze readers and cast a looming shadow over Freemasonry through his pseudonym, Leo Taxel. In 1867, he borrowed a book on Freemasonry from a close friend. However, being raised in a strictly religious family and knowing the Catholic Church was vehemently anti-Masonic, the book having been confiscated, he nevertheless remained interested in Freemasonry. In 1881, Jogan Pages was initiated into the Masonic Lodge Les Amis de Léonore Français, the Friends of French Honor. But he did not progress further because in August of that year he was expelled for literary theft and publishing of pornography. Disillusioned as well with religion, Jogan Pages also had authored and published anti-Catholic texts. Upon reading the paper letter, Human Genus, an encyclical that described Freemasonry as a quote-unquote wicked force and a quote-unquote contagious disease by Pope Leo XIII, he pretended conversion to Catholicism and denounced his previous writings against the Church. He was soon absolved by the papal nuncio in France from excommunications previously recorded against him. Next, Jogan Pages sought to prove the gullibility of the Catholic Church by quote-unquote exposing the secrets of Freemasonry citing his past involvement with the fraternity as his source. He began with a four-volume history of Freemasonry entitled The Complete Revelations of French Masonry, which focused on alleged eyewitness accounts of Satanism in the fraternity, as well as other claims that were subsequently promoted and distributed by church officials. Even though they never pursued even a meeting with the supposed individuals to confirm whether accounts were credible, Thus, readers were presented with initiations involving the sacrifice of a sheep, the murder of a traitor for divulging the secrets of the order, the use of the Baphomet as imagery in relation to the craft, and accounts of alleged Masonic black masses and invocations in Masonic lodges. At the center of the hoax was an alleged religious order within the craft called Palladian Freemasonry. And its most important character was one Diana Vaughn, In his The Brethren of the Three Points, 1885, Taxo claimed that that Palladian Freemasonry was overseen by illustrious Albert Pike, who he claimed was considered, quote-unquote, the Pope of the Freemasons, with the title of Supreme Commander, Grand Master of the Supreme Council of the Mother Lodge of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Charleston. In 1891, Taxo published Are There Women in Freemasonry, which discussed the Palladian Order. 
that allegedly controlled Freemasonry worldwide. The order described was androgynous, meaning it had both men and women in its membership, and it was known as the Order of the Palladium, a sovereign council of wisdom. It was allegedly constituted on May 20th, 1737, and in Taxel's book titled The Devil in the 19th Century, the Palladian Order was described as having been based in Charleston, South Carolina, which was known as the Venice of America, the Rome of Satan, and the great city of Lucifer. The supposed inner order was comprised of one feminine grade and two masculine grades. Women were initiated under the title of Companion of Penelope, while the men were initiated into the Adelphis and Companions of Ulysses. Diana Vaughn, an alleged descendant of Thomas Vaughn, a Rosicrucian alchemist from the 1600s, had attained the titles of Grand Mistress of the Temple and Grand Inspectress of the Palladium, as well as being called the Grand Priestess of the Masonic Order. However, in 1895, citing a vision from God, Diana denounced her membership, fled the order, went into hiding, and published Confessions of an Ex-Palladist, which purportedly served to expose the secrets of Palladian masonry. It was in this confession, sent to Pope Leo XIII himself in 1895, that Diana described a Masonic Black Mass, writing that the rites performed and the words spoken during the continuance of the magical ceremony are blasphemous in character, and the sacred vessel and its contents are subjected to insult and mockery. Brother Arthur Edward Waite subsequently published two books on the hoax, Devil Worship in France and Diana Vaughan and the Question of Modern Palladism. In writing about the fictitious Palladian order, Brother Waite noted that Taxel had described the group as quote-unquote engaged in orgiastic and blasphemous ceremonies at which demons appeared and miracles happened, and as seeking to quote-unquote overthrow the Catholic Church and the established social order, strikingly similar allegations had already been directed at Freemasonry in Pope Leo XIII's Human Genius. The rest of the issue really goes into a great deal about the Taxel hoax, including an article called The Devil's Weed and the Luciferian Freemasonry Hoax of Leo Taxel by Chris Bennett. Also, one of my favorite articles in the issue, The Mysterious Origins of Diana Vaughn by Eric L. Arneson. And of course, The Confessions of Leo Taxel by Alan Bernheim. And a bunch of other small segments that will really illuminate the entire subject. Now, the point being here is that Leo Taxel is Diana Vaughn. I've heard rumors that when the Catholic Church asked Diana Vaughn to come forward and to address a crowd of people, it couldn't happen because if it had, then Leo Taxel would have to be a man dressed as a woman to address the people about all of these spurious things. And so it is quite hilarious that such a obvious kind of prank has been carried so far that, I mean, there are entire websites dedicated to the slandering of Masons and to the continual promotion of ideas that we know are false. And they say, oh, you're just not high enough on the ladder yet. Well, like the guy who wrote this stuff... Leo Taxel, Chagon Pages, actually wrote more, and he explained the whole thing about how he made it all up just to make fun of Catholics for being, according to him, easy believers of, of uh, spurious and, and wild claims. But it is uh, interesting, always. So again, check out the Fraternal Reviews website, theresearchlodge.com. Pick up that issue, and uh, if you see so fit, check out that awesome annual book. I know I'm going to get mine. All right, so for this week, we want to check out one random tarot card draw. As in previous weeks, all we're doing here is I'm going to pick a random tarot card, look at its prescribed meaning in the system that the cards are by, and then we'll look at a practical meaning and then finally, how we can apply that in our lives to be good men and become better and even look at some Masonic correlations. So let's do that right now. So this week, I'm going to use a tarot deck that I reviewed on TikTok under my uh, handle there, the Wizard of Arge. And this is one of my favorite decks in terms of the art that it has. It's called the Wizard's Tarot by the Wizard of Barge. I really love the artwork. It's absurd and silly, but that's kind of my style. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and take a look here. Now, 
Uh, as I go through this process of preparing the deck and drawing a card, I'll just go ahead and say a few words. And that is that, as a Freemason, I don't use tarot or blend it in with my Masonic practices. For the people listening, thinking, oh, it's a Masonic, this is like a great Masonic podcast, and, you know, what is what is Robert doing? What's RJ doing with a tarot in this? You know, do I need to start learning tarot? Uh, I'm weirded out by that. Or maybe you're thinking that uh, this is an affirmation that tarot actually does have something to do with Freemasonry. And here's the thing. I like tarot. It's something that I've studied for over 10 years, and I use it as a contemplative tool to better understand the world around me. And so I think it's complementary to Freemasonry, but it is not Freemasonry. It has nothing to do with Freemasonry, really. So I want to make that abundantly clear. I'm just giving the cards a shuffle. Sometimes people ask, you know, do you have a specific number of times you shuffle the deck? No, I don't. I just shuffle until I feel it's good. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of spread these out and draw a card. See what I get. All right. Now, in this particular deck, there's no white card, but it, it does actually talk about how to interpret the different suits, right? So normally there's wands, cups, pentacles, and swords. In this, you've got beasts, curses, cults, and swords. And so all of the meaning behind the card is just that. Uh, just as a fun aside, it has its archetypal meaning in this particular system released back in 2019. Again, just a really cool artistic rendition of the cards. And we'll pull our classic meaning in just a moment. So what card did we get? I'll flip it over. Ooh, we got the Knight of Swords. So uh, swords is swords in this deck. So great. What does the Knight of Swords do for us? Well, we pulled the card uh, as an upright. So essentially, uh, it tells us that we have, uh, we are somebody, or perhaps we're going to meet somebody, or we can think about this in terms of a person, whether it's us or somebody else, that is always busy, always looking for success. They're witty, quick-witted, they are ambitious, always doing something. Now, traditionally, you know, I'll post a picture of this card, which is quite a bit different than the traditional way this card looks. Traditionally, the Knight of Swords shows a knight. He's dressed in his armor. He's moving forward, and he's on a white horse. So he's moving forward, right? This is like the idea of ambition. He's got his, his sword up in the air, which is a movement of preparation or dedication to whatever he's going to do. And of course, the white horse is symbolic as well. It's like a purity thing. So we're thinking about purity of intellect, just like the dog in the fool card is uh, representative of intellect. So is the horse in this with the white meaning purity. So he's got purity of intellectual energy, and that's really what drives him to his mission or to success. And then in the background of the card, there's additional iconography that shows you almost a juxtapose. There's storm. There's a storm that's, that's brewing. And the trees are starting to bend because of the strong winds. And yet the Knight of Swords is moving into the direction of the wind, suggesting that he won't let any kind of adversity meet him on the field of battle. So that's kind of what the typical card looks like. That's not at all what the, the Wizard's Tarot will show you. The Wizard's Tarot is a, a silly goblin-like creature who is splitting another goblin creature down the middle. It's kind of, uh, kind of gross. <laughs> uh, but if you're curious to see what that looks like, you can head on over to the Facebook group, The Craftsman Plus, if you are a supporter of the program, and check out what that looks like. I'll also have a link back to the deck if you're curious on buying it. Now, what does the card mean? I talked a little bit about that just briefly, but in general, knights within a tarot deck are people that are oriented towards a goal or a mission. It represents somebody who has their ideas that they want to move toward their idea as a goal to be finished and that nothing is going to stop you from doing it. You are resolute or whoever it represents is resolute in their goal. And the sword is indicative of intellect also. So within this, right, he's using his intellect 
to solve an issue. Typically, if you draw this card upright, this is kind of an affirmation that you are, de it's defining you almost as an ambitious person and that you're very motivated to accomplish whatever you have set your mind to and that you are really not going to be stopped by anyone who opposes this or gets in the way. Also, the Knight of Swords suggests the, because of the, the steed that you're quick to take action. And also, maybe you're not going to plan ahead very much. Instead, you're just going to dive right in. This, uh, I find in my own life, very meaningful because I don't tend to think about small details. I see the big picture, and if I have an idea of how it's going to go, it is 90% done. That's just me, though. But that's how I've interpreted this card for myself at times. And of course, with acting very quickly can come the downside that maybe you have not thought about all the options and now you have created a series of small obstacles you'll have to overcome. So there is this idea that maybe we're, as a knight of swords, we're not planning ahead as much as we should. And lastly, I will say that this doesn't always mean people might be thinking about sales or something. You know, you're going to meet your sales goals or something. But alternatively, think about an, an, another kind of success, and that is the mastery of a topic of an educational topic, of a subject in particular that you actually want to conquer because you're on the white horse and your sword is raised high. This could be that you are looking to become the subject matter expert on some intellectual topic. Maybe you are preparing to deliver a speech or an argument of a type. Maybe you're trying to raise your lodge's dues and in order to do so, you have had to become the subject matter expert and nothing's going to stop you from your goal of delivering a solid presentation on why something like raising the dues or why meals need to be served before lodge instead of after lodge or, you know, whatever the case might be. I would say your takeaway for this card is really that you should think to yourself, what am I really driven to right now? What's the thing that's on my plate that I am just so excited about doing? Even if it's something you may have put on the back burner, something you're excited about, what is that thing? Then think about the opposition in that card, right? The storm and the wind. What What is that in your life? Is that your boss? Is that a lodge? Is it a few brothers? Then think about the conflict, perhaps, and how to address the conflict in a way that maybe Right, going down to the downside of this particular card is that maybe you're not thinking ahead so much. So in, in this instance, maybe it's a warning. We need to think ahead. We need to think diplomatically. I will post a picture for you to contemplate the meaning of this card and feel free to leave any of your thoughts about the particular card in the Facebook group. That's it for this week. I want to thank you all for coming on this journey of education with me and self-betterment. Through the process of examining Freemasonry and its related sciences, I want to thank one more time the producers, contributors, fellows, and legacy partners of the program. Thank you for all of your assistance in helping to bring this education to anybody interested. One more time, I want to give a thanks to Stephen L. Harrison for all of his work. Please, again, check out our YouTube channel, like and subscribe. The videos there, subscribe to the channel. Uh, all of this stuff helps us get. Uh, legitimate Masonic information out there and you know be, then then we don't have to deal with so many taxal hoax people and, and anti-Masonic sentiments out there on on the YouTube and wherever. So until next week stay on the level for Whence Came You I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.
Live Media. That's it. Okay, girl.